think in 2019, if this patient would come into the office today and knowing we know about the case, I would say that we'd look and we'd say this patient's stage four. So I think many of us would, would talk about chemotherapy first, interval debulking, chemotherapy, and then maintenance treatment. And with um, the newer studies showing that part maintenance is, is an important part of that, uh, we would want to do genetic testing. And again, genetic testing would include looking at the germline status. So have the patient see us in the office, talk about chemotherapy, talk about surgery, talk about CT guided biopsy to get the patient ready for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. An important part would be having her either see a genetic counselor within the office or sometimes uh, we'll have to do that type of counseling within the office because they may not be available to come back. And I would recommend some type of panel test to look for any type of genetic uh, uh, predisposition for ovarian cancer. That's very important for this patient and that it's going to help direct her treatments because I think the treatment has changed since 2014 when this patient presented. If this patient had a germline BRC mutation, uh, she would get chemotherapy, surgery, chemotherapy, and then would receive maintenance therapy with a PARP inhibitor at that point. If she would get genetically tested, it, the, there's been many um, PARP inhibitor studies that have been, pre, uh, been recently reported. Solo one looked at um, advanced stage patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer treated with maintenance lapirib. And that most recently at ESMO, um, a study uh, reported by Tassar GSK was the PRIMA trial looking at single agent Narapra for patients with germline uh, mutations, as well as all comers in another study, Paola, that looked at this as well. So in, in today's 2019 management, we'd want to know what the germline status is. And then a lot of us would send the tumor off for tumor testing to look for tumor uh, genetic alterations in uh, BRCA1 and 2 as well as some of us would look for what this is called genomic instability or HRD. And to me, based off of those test results, you may triage this patient to a different maintenance strategy at that point. So the strategy that we're using now, and I think that this is very complex because the results of the ESMO trials, the uh, SOLA1 trial, uh, ESMO trial, uh, the PAOLA trial, as well as the PRIMA trial, all showed clinical benefit. And really, uh, SOLO1 was germline mutation patients and somatic uh, mutation patients. So when we're in the wild type realm, it really boils down as do, do uh, clinicians believe in what's called homologous recombination deficiency or HRD testing. Personally, I do. I think the HRD test is another way to, to look and try to capture more patients who may benefit from maintenance therapy. And the two trials did show that in the HRD positive patients, uh, those that had the genomic instability type of score, that those patients benefited either from single agent niraparib or a combination of alaparib and bevacizumab. So I look at the patients who have a germline mutation or a somatic mutation of BRCA1 and BRCA2. I would give them chemotherapy and surgery, and then they would be treated with PARP maintenance, whether it's alaparib or niraparib. And then the patients who were noted to be BRCA wild type test their tumor. Again, if their tumor was positive, that's a somatic mutation, they would get single agent niraparib or a lap rib. And then if those are both negative, then you look for the HRD testing. If the patients are HRD positive, what many of us are doing, we're going with single agent niraparib. Some people would use the combination of a lap rib and bevacizumab. Again, it's very confusing because you can see the same group of patients choosing two different potential regimens. And then in the HRD proficient patients are the ones that have a, a score that shows that their tumor does not have any deficiency. Um, most of us would say we should probably be using niraparib in that group and then saving bevacizumab for possibly later. So to me, I think that that's how I've looked at some of this data. I think that if you would ask four or five different treating medical oncologists as well as G1 oncologists that you may get different interpretations of the data. And I think it's gonna take us a few years to try to figure out how to use this upfront testing. And you know, is combination therapy better than single agent therapy or is really single agent therapy the way to go? And then we're not using our bevacizumab at this time and we can potentially use that for unfortunately when these patients recur. Because as you go through this case, as we know, unfortunately the majority of these patients with ovarian cancer have advanced stage disease. Ultimately they'll recur and with that recurrence, we want to make sure and have more treatment options available at that time.